Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. My name is Bill Benson. I have hosted the museum's First Person program since it began in 2000. Thank you for joining us today. Through these monthly conversations, we bring you firsthand accounts of survival of the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. During our program, please send us your questions and let us know where you are joining us from in the chat. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Helena Peabody share her personal firsthand account of the Holocaust with us. Helena, welcome and thank you so much for being willing to be our first person. Thank you very much for your introduction. Thank you very much and hello everybody. Helena, you have so much to share with us, so we're going to go ahead and get started. You were born December 12, 1932 in Poland. Please begin today by telling us about your family and life in your hometown of Zalaszczyki leading up to World War II. Well, this was a resort town and uh, the weather was fantastic in the summer. It was very hot. We could go uh, on the water and uh, in the winter you could go skiing there and skating there. My mother was a champion swimmer, so she loved the water. She did water skiing there too. And uh, she taught me to skate and to ski and uh, she loved every sport. And my father was a dentist, so he was, he's the one in the middle. My mother is in front of him to the, to the left are two, two of my grandparents who came for a visit from Krakow where we were all born. And this is a friend on the right. So Helena, you started to tell us about your father's occupation. So he was a, a young, young dentist at the time, right? That's correct. And that's why we were in the small towns of Zalaszczyki because he felt that it was too difficult to start a practice in a town like Krakow, full of professionals. Mm -hmm. So when they got married, they decided to find a smaller place and Zalaszczyk was a perfect little place for, for us because uh, the weather was wonderful and uh, we had a very nice life there. You, you already mentioned that your mom was uh, quite the athlete. Tell us more about her. She was really a very, very unique person. Well, she was a natural. She, she started swimming very young when her older sister, that's Irka here, uh, her older sister, Irka, when the other sister... So Irka's on, the, on, on our left, right? Yeah. Yes, my mother is on the right and I'm in the middle. And so when they, she took her to the water and she was just beginning to learn to swim, she still was so fast, nobody could keep up with her. And eventually she won the Polish championship, became very famous and uh, enjoyed every other sport that she could. She was just absolutely fearless. She jumped from the highest platform. She skied and also jumped on skis. She skated and as I said, I was skating at five because she taught me. And I had bicycles and tricycles and dolls and my Shirley Temple doll, which I have it still. Uh, not the real one, but somebody bought me one just mm. as a memory. <laughs> So the life was very, very good. In fact, she was not just the national Polish champion. I think she was for three consecutive years. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She was going to the Olympics, but the crow came in. She did. She did the others. Uh, the, 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 which one is that one? The, well, like the breaststroke. Yeah. The breaststroke. Yes. Yeah. And when the crow came in, apparently that did not make her the fastest anymore. So she did not make the Olympics. Oh. That's what she told me. Tell, tell us a little bit more about Zalaszczyki. Um, you said it was a resort town and it was, um, I believe, right on the river Dniester. Is that correct? Dniester, yes. It was a natural, Dniester was a natural frontier between Poland and uh, you, uh, Romania. And you, when you went on the boat, you could go only halfway. 
because it was it had boys in the middle and uh, but it was a very friendly frontier and you could walk over get a daily pass to go though so, you know we used to go over for grapes and and other fruit although we had them in the garden you could grow all these things in a garden because the weather was so fantastic so yeah. we we could go anytime and as i said it was very very friendly and you you, you described that you had uh, two beaches in Zalaschiki, and I like the name of the beaches, and here you are at the beach. Yes, sunny and shady. That's the name of the beaches, right? Yep. One was sunny, one was shady, yes. So what, the, what, what was it like for you to grow up in a resort town? I mean, that sounds remarkable. Well, this was a wonderful, it was a wonderful life, uh, as long as it was peaceful. Right. <laughs> and then uh, my mother, uh, explained to me that, uh, well, she had the big tummy, but I was going to have a brother or a sister. Never told me it was a stork coming, not stork coming. No, she just told me the truth. My mother always told me the truth. And she went back to Krakow uh, to give birth because she wanted to be near her mother. So I was left with my father and waited for my mother to come back with my baby sister. And she and this is Eva, who I think was born in June of 1939, just really two months before the war began. Um, we have another photograph here. Tell us about this before we begin to talk about the war years. Photograph of um, your yeah. That again is uh, the before the war. That's my father, the first one. There's a friend of ours, and my mother is in the middle, and then my grand grandfather. And then there's another lady friend, and then my grandmother, and a friend again. And uh, uh, they were. This was still before the war. They were just on the road, just just on the river to uh, enjoy the weather and and the the views there. Yeah, it's a lovely photograph. Yeah. Alina, in September 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland from the west while the Soviet Union invaded from the east, occupying your town. Your father fled across the Dniester River into Romania. Tell us why your father uh, went across to Romania at that time. My father and many other people um, grabbed whatever they could. The, the gate was open. And when they heard that they were going to be um, overtaken by the Russians, they rushed over. My father, because he was afraid of being conscripted into the Russian army, which was what they did in the First World War, and that's like 20 years hard labor, and you couldn't get out. So he, he ran away by himself because he felt that he was the one in danger, and he didn't think women and children are, are in danger. But uh, after a while, the Russians came in, they demanded the gold and the silver and they, they pilfered and they took some people and arrested them for whatever they felt needed to be. And, um, and my father and some other people that rushed in, in over so quickly decided maybe things are now settled. And you know, maybe they could just slip by quietly over and just go back to their families. Mm -hmm. um, the river was frozen over, so they tried to cross back over the frozen river. And what happened was that the Russians had sealed the border by then, and they caught them all, including my father, and they arrested them all. And in my father's case, they said that um, he was a spy because he went and he came back and they, on, trial, on the trial, they gave him 20 years hard labor and sent him off to Russia. And uh, for one year, we didn't hear anything. So they sent him to, and to Siberia, right? For to Siberia for hard labor. That's 20 year it. sentence. And was there, a, was there any fear that you and your mother or sister could also be sent uh, away? Indeed, there was. Uh, they, they, we were ready. My mother was all packed. We were supposed to be taken to Russia as well, to Siberia, but uh, they didn't pick us up. Nobody knew why. But they threw us out of a house 
to a small town just uh, just out of the um, I don't know not too far from from our little town called Twister and that we were told to live to live in a sort of uh, home for uh, different other people that they throw out and that's where we were supposed to be so you ended up in Twilsta at that time. Yes. Before, we, before we go on, Alina, I'd like to let you know that there are a lot of people from a lot of different places uh, watching you and listening to you today. We have viewers joining us from Florida, Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, Montana, and we have international viewers today from Brazil, Canada, and the United Kingdom, and students, including eighth graders from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And we have some comments coming in already from viewers. Shivani says, thank goodness for the first person conversations with Holocaust survivors. The value of such media outreach is so direct with the opportunity to hear firsthand experience. So now, Helena, you are in this new town, um, Twista, Twista yes. under the Soviet occupation. What was life like under the Soviets for you with your mother alone caring for you and your baby sister, Eva? I frankly don't know how she managed. Um, I do know that I was put in school, but instead of going to kindergarten, that was I was supposed to go, um, they dropped everybody one class. So I was pre-kindergarten. The reason for that is because they already made the plans that they were going to forever stay there and they were going to, um, teach us how to be good communists. I was, you know, <laughs> six and a half, seven years old, but that was apparently the plan. So they're, they're, they're basically to, to train you to become a communist at that time. That's correct, yes. yes. And the picture we just saw, that was you and your mother and your sister that's while living in Twilsta under the Soviets. Correct. And that's yeah. the only baby picture of her that we have. A, a, a couple of moments ago, Helena, you mentioned that uh, your you, your mother didn't hear you. None of you heard from your father for uh, a good long time. But eventually, you did. You did get some correspondence from him. After a year, apparently, that he had been in the prison for that year, uh, then he was out working the hard labor part, and so he contact, contacted us. And he told us where he was, and he was in Arhangelsk in Russia, and he was working there. And uh, he just wanted to know if everybody was how we were doing, and uh, had a little bit of contact with us. So my mother did uh, send him a pillow, I remember, and just a, a few, a couple of times, the exchange of letters. And of course, that would end when the when the and Germans turned on the Soviet. Yes. Before we go on to that, Helena, let me share with you another comment from a viewer. Um, she says, I, or he or she says, I am a teacher and I cannot express how valuable your work is for today's youth. Thank you with a nice big heart attached to the end of the message. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to also remind our audience to please share your questions for Helena via the chat feature. Helena, you were eight years old when Germany attacked the Soviet Union and occupied the rest of Poland, including where you were living. Conditions, of course, turned dramatically worse for Jews, including for your family. Tell us what happened once the Germans took control of where you were living in Poland. Yes, when the Germans were coming, the Russians disappeared and my mother just packed us up and we went back to Zalaszczyki and to our house and settled in waiting for the next occupier. And uh, then they arrived with great noise and, and uh, uh, it was very frightening. They came on, on motorcycles with very flashy uh, black boots. I remember I was standing there, you know, and watching and I remember my mother pulling me away. It was just a frightening, frightening thing just to see them. But the moment they came, they made a very, very big difference to our lives. And I realized that being Jewish is the worst thing I could be at this point, because um, the, the the Jews had the worst the worst of of the laws that they put in. Um, first of all, we had to put a Jewish star on our house, on all the clothes we wore. There were no school for children, 
there was uh, everybody, every single person had to be working for the Germans. And they um, demanded certain groups of people uh, going out. They would take a group of people out into the country to do some jobs. And that came, that became a sort of a way to, to, to get everybody to work. Okay. And uh, what, what, did, what was the work your mother was forced to do? Uh, my mother's job was to knit for the mayor of the town's children, German, of course. They had lists of everybody. They knew who, who knew what. And they knew my mother was a very good knitter. Mm -hmm. So that was her job, and she did. She, everybody was very cooperative. We all tried very hard. And if there was a no job for somebody, they would make them clean the sidewalks. But everybody did what they were told to do. And then one day, of course, a story that you have painfully remember, um, a large number of young men and women were demanded to go work in a nearby forest. Can you tell us about that day? Yes, this time they said there was a big job. They had to be uh, covering the uh, young tree trunks for the winter. The winter was very harsh. And they were supposed to take burlap and, and, and cover the, 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 the trunks of the trees. And about over 600 people went, young people mainly, and some even went, you know, just came as volunteers. And so they walked them out. So, so volunteered even more than the number that they gathered. Yes, that's right. That's right. Everybody wanted to help. You know, as I said, we were very cooperative. We wanted everything to be just right. So, and then we waited for them to come back. And nobody came back. And we didn't know what happened. Everybody was terribly nervous. And I remember we were, we were just, we were just, we just didn't know what, what was happening until uh, late at night, my mother explained to me what happened. The man, one man managed to escape. And he told us that uh, when they came, what they found, no job, uh, the, there were graves, open graves with sticks over them. And they were told to undress and lay on those sticks and they were shot. And as they were shot, they dropped into the grave. And uh, they didn't even want to have the trouble of having to bury them. So that was, that's what they did. And then um, my the guy that managed to escape was on top. And uh, when they left, and uh, the, the, the graves were full, so he was one of the top ones, and he managed to drag himself out. He had had uh, a one shot, uh, they missed his heart and hit his arm, which was loose, and he never recovered that. And he told the story, what happened. And at this point, of course, everybody was understood what was happening and started looking for hiding places. For the next time, they would ask for somebody to come to work. In, in September 1942, Helena, Nazi authorities forced the remaining Jewish community in Zalaszczyki uh, to Tulsta, where you had been before. Correct. And it became an open ghetto in December of 1942. Open ghettos were not surrounded by walls, and Jews could come and go a little bit more freely than in a closed ghetto. Tell us what you and your mother did once you arrived in Twilsta. Well, the first thing everybody was looking for hiding places. And she talked to me as if I was a grown up, but she had to, you know, make me understand what was happening. She said that uh, it's not the end, and they expected that, that they will do the same here with the groups. They were going to take groups and nobody was coming back. So everybody was looking for hiding places preparing for the next demand for people. Um, and um, sure enough, there was a demand again. This time they said they needed more people for work in Germany and uh, everybody hid as best as they could. Um, now we, my mother took my sister and me to a lady that she knew from before because you know we had been there before so she met some people she put me with the lady and uh, she put me in the attic and she and my baby sister went to another lady where 
she paid her in advance to just keep her during the day whilst they were collecting the people that they needed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, I waited all day long. We, I was terrified that she was caught. I didn't know what was going on. The lady that kept me kept telling me that my mother was not caught, but she told me some people I knew that were caught and they were all put in a square openly and they were waiting to get the right number. They always, you know, had to have a number. And uh, as the day went on, there were more people coming. They found another lot of people, but my mother was not seen. But you had no idea at the time where your mom was or if she was no, safe. No, I had no, no. Not at all. I just had this f- terrible fear and, and, and the worry that my mother might be caught. And um, towards the evening, they finally put the people on the train. And then my mother did come with my sister to pick me up. And she said to me, she was just as traumatized as I was. She said, we'll never do this again because all day long she thought I was caught. And she said, we will never, never go separately. We will stay together for whatever happens. Whatever happens will happen to the three of us. Uh, and then she told me what happened to her. The lady that had her got scared in the middle of the day and threw her out, just simply throw her out into the, into the grass. There was a grassy knoll there. And she said there was one bush. And she crouched under that bush for the rest of the day with my sister. And she said there were aeroplanes flying around. They were looking for stragglers. By some miracle, they did not spot her. And that's why she said we will, we will, as I say, stay together from now on. And then everybody again went back to trying to figure out if there is a way to escape. Is there any way to to run away? Is there? There was no way. They so tried that, everything. That's what led your mother, uh, and with the help of some friends, yeah. uh, to buy false documents from a priest identifying you as Catholics. Um, tell us how they managed to get those documents and what that meant for you. Well, first of all, they, they said that, look, and that they were all such good friends. Uh, they, they helped my mother with so many things. But they said, look, you're, you're three females. You know, you can't be checked if you're Jewish. You know that men can be checked, women cannot. And uh, you don't look Jewish, you don't speak Yiddish, uh, you're blonde, green-eyed like me. Uh, Perhaps we will have a chance of uh, passing as non-Jewish. And perhaps we could help you get the papers, you know, as, as somebody else. And... They took my mother to a priest, and uh, he just issued new identity cards for everybody. Which is what we see here, right? Yes, I gave them to the museum, yes. So that's that's actually your identification paper. That's my, yes, my my, my birth birth, uh, certificate. Falsified. Falsified as a Catholic. We we have a close-up. It's a little difficult to see, but... The circled part, that's that's your name, and it says right underneath that, it's it's at um uh, it's 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 vertical, so a little difficult to see, but it says Roman Catholic under your name, there yeah. they call you Alina. Yeah, they dropped the H for no good reason. That is something that I've never uh, Alina is a Polish name, so I don't know why they dropped the H, yeah. but anyway, I became Alincha, which I hated. But anyway, that's that's just by the way. Yes. And, and Helena, it's one thing to get, as difficult as it was, to get the paper saying that you are now somebody yeah. else, you're now a Catholic, but yeah. there's a lot more to trying to pass as a Catholic than that. What What did that mean for you? How did you, how did you manage to well, learn what you had to learn? My job was to learn my new name, my new grandparents, my new birthplace, and my mother just sat me down and taught me that mm-hmm. there was, you know, there was no other way, and uh, I learned. And she said, you know, that that's what your identity is right now. And I understood very well what I have to do. I very much wanted to live, and I knew that if they catch us, then, you know, we have no choice. And we knew the children did not uh, survive at all. 
So right. I knew what my job was to be, and I became my mother's partner. And when we think about that, you were just 10 years of age doing that. Um, 10 in those days, you know, you grow up very fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so, and then she told me that we were going to try and go to a town of Yaroslav, which was apparently a Yuden free, they called it, no Jews. They apparently took all the Jews out there. There are no Jews there. So that's where we were going and to try and pass. Uh, friends took us to the railway station and they um, said goodbye. And none of them, by the way, survived for very long, but the, the, they were the friends. And um, we said goodbye. We had uh, some suitcase and some other luggage. And uh, my mother just carried my sister and me by the hand. We walked, we settled down in a, in a carriage. And um, we knew that the tr this was going to take two days and four, two nights to travel to Yaroslav. The old, olden times, it, was, it took much longer. And um, we uh, settled in. And uh, we, we had to change in the middle somewhere. But in the meantime, we just sat in and settled in and started going. And uh, somewhere, sometime, I don't know, I didn't pay much attention. Suddenly, my mother quietly said to me, you know, this man that's talking to me here, he is a Volksdeutsch. He is a partially German. They had some you know, special advantages being partially German. And you referred to as Volksdeutsch, so basically German folk. And, yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I and he apparently he apparently pushed her very, very hard. He suspected that we we were not who we said we were. And my mother said she she just had to she she just gave in. She said and and yeah, so I admitted that we were Jewish. And at that point he said, well I am going to Yaroslav as well, so I'm going to accompany you. And um, uh, when we get to Yaroslav, I will pass you over to the Gestapo. And uh, so that's how we continued to travel. He was very careful not to. Uh, one of the kids were always in his sight because he knew that we weren't going to run. We weren't going to run, but he was very careful. And so he took care of us. So you know, and until. Uh, until we got to Yaroslav. And uh, as far as I was concerned, I understood that going to the Gestapo was the end. And um, as we got off the play, of the train in Yaroslav, I started pulling at my mother. I suddenly realized what was happening. And uh, I said, Mom, Mom, I don't want to die. And uh, my mother, well, what could she do? But she asked him, she said, um, why don't you just let her go? And she's blonde, again, green-eyed, maybe she'll survive. Well, but just you go, you by yourself. Yes, yes. Yeah. But I said, no, I don't know if he'd said yes or no even. I said, I'm not going without you. So that mm -hmm. was that. And so we started walking towards the Gestapo. And um, my mother, again, she never gave up. So she, at one point, says this, look, I gave you everything I have. Keep it. Why don't you just let us go and try our luck? And, uh, and then she added, um, why do you want us on your conscience? And uh, something touched him. He did have children. So he stopped and turned around and gave my mother a few zlotes back and said to her, from bad to worse, in Polish it's from, 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 from meaning from rain to underneath the, and uh, that's no good translation, but it's from bad to worse that he felt that we got from bad to worse because that we had nothing you know, we were just without anything. And, uh, but he left us, he just walked off. And, and I just might add here, Helena, that 
your mother had already, other than the few dollars in, in Polish money, of course, that he yeah. gave back to your mom, um, he had the tickets for your luggage, so you had, had everything, nothing. Everything. We had nothing at all. Just my the mother, clothes on your back. My mother was carrying my sister and me by the hand, and there were the three of us standing in the middle of a strange town, <laughs> just, 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 just standing there, not knowing what to do. And, and as you said a few moments ago, this was a town that was called Juden Free. Yes. That there were no Jews there, and now you're there in the middle of this town. Yes, that's right. And, um, you know, but my mother, as usual, looks around, and she's never short of trying things. So she, she spied a little cafe. And we walked into the cafe, and she asked them for some milk for my sister and um, started asking people there, other people there, if there was anybody who knew of a, of a place where we could find lodgings. And uh, somebody got up, a young man, and he said, yes, there's a washerwoman not too far from here, and she takes lodgers, and I'll take you over there. And she walked us over there. So uh, when we got there, uh, my mother said, um, you know, I don't have any money, but as of tomorrow, I go to work and whatever I may I earn, I bring to you for keeping us. <laughs> and and she, she said, okay. And then her sons come up and came up and said, oh, my mom, don't take her. You know, after the four days and four nights on the train, you can imagine that we didn't look very attractive. But she said, oh, no, she said, this is a mother and two children. I have to take her. And we have a picture of the actual house here. Yes, don't we? yes. Then that house had three um, separate, well, I, I, I don't call them apartments, but we were in the middle one. And, uh, and she took us. She gave us a bed. And... Um, were lovely. I slept at the feet and uh, it was warm. And uh, gingerly, gingerly, my, my mother went to work the next day. And uh, I uh, was told that I have to go to school. And my and, and the lady, the, the lovely landlady, looked after my sister, who was not well. She was very sick, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's how we started our lives. Uh, what, what kind of work was your mother able to find at first? When just... home, house, household, she would stop somewhere in houses. Apparently, that's what she told me. And she, she was actually proud of being able to learn how to help ladies at home. You know, they needed work help, so she would stop there. I've never, I don't, never seen one, but she told me how she did it, and they all needed help. So they're just cleaning the house, just like a cleaning lady. And uh, and that meant that she also got a little food uh, because, you know, the food was very short. And that's how we started our lives there. And uh, as I said, then I had to go to school. And, um, and of course, to church on Sunday. So the information I had was that I have to... Um, cross myself after dipping my right hand in holy water I had to cross myself and coming in and coming out yeah. and that's all I knew but in the school uh, the religious part was taught by by a priest and what he gave us was a little booklet called catechism which uh, gave us gave gave me questions and answers, questions and answers. So I swallowed that book because it gave me so much information that saved me. So I was a little bit knowledgeable, and uh, that's how we started to live. Uh, Lena, do you re do you recall whether or not there you are learning this catechism? I think you had. We have a photograph, in fact, um, of you. Tell us what this photograph is. Well, eventually they prepared me for communion. I was at the age, didn't expect that, nine or ten, I think, when there was time for communion. There were three of us, and the three of us were taught, and we had a special time where we went up to the altar close. We had the lily, and we had the picture of Jesus, 
and uh, and we began on communion. And uh, well, I wondered, you know, what what I should be thinking because I knew I was Jewish, uh, but I felt that this was very important and this was beautiful religion, but not mine. But it was my job to just play this role. And did anybody, any of your classmates, do you remember if anybody had any suspicions that you were, you, that you remember? No. No. You, just, no. you played no. it beautifully, it sounds like. Well, you, they didn't expect me, you know, they didn't right. simply, you know, they didn't expect they, that. Mm -hmm. And so I was very, very careful. And so was my mother. My mother was worried about my sister's hair because it was very curly and uh, the Polish girl's straight blonde hair. Mine was quite kind of wavy, and they put it into to, uh, plates, plats, plats, they used to call it. And they, they, they did that. But um, my sister's, what she was so worried about that, that she shaved her head altogether mm -hmm. a couple of times, claiming that it'll make it thicker, which she didn't think wrong. And Helena, in the meantime, while you're uh, yeah. going to school and, 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 and doing all that you're doing to, to be as careful as you can, your mother is taking other jobs. Um, and, and at one point she was going to volunteer to go work in Germany. Yes. Well, she felt that she was always worried because the Polish people are very good at recognizing Jews. And she knew that the, the Germans always welcome workers. So she thought if we go to Germany for work, it will be safer because the Germans are not, they're not so good at recognizing Jews. But uh, she we were turned down because of my sister. We would have had to leave my sister because she was too small, because I oh. could work and she could work. But my sister was a baby, so and my mother would not leave my sister, obviously, so we didn't go. But then she, she never gave up, so she decided that she was going to simply walk into the German military camp and... Uh, and ask for a job. And uh, <laughs> the, the chutzpah that was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, but, you know, she felt that that, that that might be very helpful to have the Ausweis, the ID, showing that she's working for the Germans. And, and, and that's what we see here, her Ausweis, right? She asked for our papers. And yeah. this is the other thing my mother worried about. We had some weeks where we didn't know whether they're going to come and kill us or, or not. But no, they did not. They didn't have computers in those days. So uh, we, she got the Ausweis and she became, she worked there. Her job was to peel potatoes for the troops. For the troops. That, but that's okay. The, the main thing was that she had the Ausweis. And like in, 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 there was occasion where they came into our, where we were living in the night and throw everybody out, rouse, rouse. And they were going to check everybody. They were looking for one of the sons of our landlady who apparently was going to, they were going, they were looking for him because he um, killed pigs for a living, which was a death sentence. So they never found him, but they were looking. At the same time, they threw everybody out and, and, and they were going to take them to Gestapo to check them out. And then my mother showed them the Ausweis. And they said, oh, no, you stay. <laughs> so we stayed. So I said it saved us, you know, that and, and gave us a little bit of, of, of assurance that, you know, she has an Ausweis. She works for the Germans, so she has a little bit of a protection. So. And, and the, in that particular raid, uh, the the woman, the washerwoman who'd brought you, in, she was eventually released and came back, right? Everybody came back. Everybody they were all back, fine, yeah. but uh, but we were spared that that you know, for us to go to a Gestapo station would have been very traumatic. Absolutely, yes. Helena. We have a video question from a student, mm -hmm. Vanessa from George Mason University. So let's let's let Vanessa ask you a question. Hi, Helena. My name is Vanessa Gutierrez, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm currently a junior at George Mason University here in Fairfax, Virginia. My question is, 
Having to live as Catholics, have you felt a disconnection to your own identity? Thank you. No, I, I did not feel at all disconnected. I knew that if I wanted to live, I had to do a good job pretending to be somebody else. And I felt that this was completely my right to do. And I, I did a good job, but I knew I was not Catholic. I sometimes wished I could be because it was a very beautiful religion, but I knew I wasn't. So You had another picture that's sort of appropriate to what you just said. Yes. Um, tell us about this. Well, Christmas time, and you see my, my sister with the curly hair, and uh, I enjoyed everything very much. And uh, it was a time where we had to keep quiet about our own. We were not uh, observant, so it did not really uh, hurt me at all. And I learned about other people and other religions. So it was a good, good time to learn. But I knew at all times that I was not Catholic. Helena, during this time you were in Yaroslav, uh, your mother received news about your father and what had happened to him after he was sent to Siberia. Yes. Will you share with us what she heard about your father? Yes, she was very careful about being in touch with the people we left behind. But uh, it, this was a very important letter that came through for us through the Red Cross. And they felt that it was absolutely a must to, to let her know. And what it was, was my father said in his letter, he was safe with his sister in Palestine which meant that he was out of Russia. And uh, that meant that he was free. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, unfortunately, it was lovely news for us, but we couldn't. We you couldn't could, do anything uh, about it. As long as we were occupied, of course. Right. Helena, before we go on, we have a question and a comment from a viewer named Naomi. Naomi asks or says, uh, asks, what kinds of things did your mother teach you to help you be brave, strong, understand, and be resilient? Was she was your childhood lost, or was she able to help you remain children while in hiding? Thank you for sharing your memories. They are so precious. Well, thank you very much for the question. My mother taught by example. So she was brave. She was, you know, always willing to give of herself and... Uh, she was always straight with me. We, we we were like, I grew up very quickly and we were like partners. We were working together to stay alive. And uh, I never worried about my mother uh, being, you know, telling me tales about or, or giving me the wrong information. I knew the dangers, everything was open. And uh, I felt that this was my duty as, as, as the older daughter and her only partner in this in this whole thing and i was very proud to be able to to be her uh, support mm -hmm. and i only wish that she had lived long enough afterwards to be able to see her children grow up but mm -hmm. she was so she was so entrenched in this the children must be saved must be saved and uh, I cannot say that. I, I, I appreciated that. How can you not? A mother like that is worth everything. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Helena, let me just remind our audience that uh, if they have any questions for you, uh, to please use the chat feature to um, send them in to you. In, in July 1944, as the Soviets were driving the Germans west they drove them out of yaroslav which meant that you were caught for a period between two armies tell us what you remember about that time well first of all <clears throat> we had no way of knowing what was going on in the front we didn't know who was winning who was losing nothing it was death penalty to watch tv not tv bbc to this is a radio mm -hmm. or, or papers. Mind you, we didn't have any anyway. Uh, so one morning we woke up. My mother was ready to get up and go to work. And usually very early on, this is a farm town. So uh, people, uh, there were carts going back and forth, back and forth. It was completely quiet on the road. 
There was nothing moving. And my mother was saying, you know, I don't know whether I should go. I don't know what's happening. Um, I was standing by the window with my hand on, on the railing. My mother was over there with my sister. And suddenly there was a tremendous bang and a bomb split up over the house. And a shrapnel hit me. And I started screaming, Mom, Mom, my hand, my hand. And my mother uh, grabbed my sister and grabbed me. And my hand was you know, uh, bleeding. Uh, she looked for help to, to pick me up, but there was nobody. And the hospital wasn't that far. We had to walk. And uh, there was absolute silence on the street, nothing. Uh, finally, we got to the hospital. They told us that the Russians were coming in, and uh, but they were taking their time. So right at that moment, so there was nothing. It was just quiet, and they immediately, um, unfortunately, had to cut off my left finger because it was on the skin. Today, they would have put it back, but not in those days. So I lost my, my thumb on my left hand and a half a little finger. And the rest of the hand was very, very bad. And you, they had to put it on a railing so that it wouldn't, you know, when you lose the finger, so it goes like that. So you had to keep your hand up. So I was on a rail for two months in the hospital. Um, the um, nuns were the, were the nurses, the wonderful nurses. And uh, they were very worried about the getting infected if they had, uh, they said if the hand gets infected, that, that that means that they would have to amputate my hand. So that was very, very scary. In the meantime, my mother, after spending the night with us at the hospital the first night, she went back to where we were living and she found out that the uh, roof over the kitchen fell down on the lady that was keeping us and killed her. Mm -hmm. And the whole place was in shambles. There was no, nothing, nothing left that she couldn't live there. But there was a neighbor, you know, the house where we were in the middle, the neighbor on one side that take, took her in with my sister. And uh, so she stayed there as long as I was in the hospital. And in the meantime, there, there was a lot of shooting going on. I remember that at night, the people used to get up and, and, and go out in order not to be in the building, in the hospital, so in case there was a bomb falling. Mm -hmm. But uh, nothing happened, and I slept. I, I sleep very well. So. But you remained in that hospital for two months. Correct, yes. How, how did your mom manage to be able to feed herself and, and your little sister during that time? She started knitting, knitting for, for, for money and also to look for my father because as i said he we knew that he was in palestine so she started knitting for that and for keeping us and she was she, she would come and tell me about all this and uh, eventually she managed to contact him and uh, the lady who kept us was very very nice and she kept as long as as we were there she was going to keep us. I stayed in the hospital. My mother was with her. With your sister? Yes, with my sister. Helena, your mother, of course, was very determined to get you and your sister out of Poland. And she, as you said, she was able to locate your father in Palestine. I might share that after his deportation, after his sentence to Siberia, he was able to join the Polish armed forces that were operating in exile there. Um, they called it Anders Army is what it was known as, and it eventually came under British command. And because of that, this allowed your family to immigrate to England. Tell us about going to England and what it was like for you to adjust to this new life after the Holocaust. And, and here you are, I believe, in England. That's correct. That's correct. Yes, it wasn't easy, uh, but, you know, it, we were free. I was still petrified of the police. Um, but we were in a in near Liverpool in a in a camp. It was actually a, a soldiers' camp they they used because they needed barracks for us all. Uh, they were very nice and kind. As I said, the, they they tried to teach us English. 
They tried to, they, they, they did all sorts of uh, helpful things. They, they gave us the rations. We could get some clothes. And, and all together, they were preparing us for settling in, in England, not knowing where we would choose. But my father and mother decided to go to London. Most of us did go to London. And you bought a house there on the never never as my mother used to call it we didn't we were never on credit in europe in those days but my mother's always called the credit never never and you bought the house and you lived on one level and the other two levels you rented out to you know to get the money to pay for the mortgage that's how it went and the first thing of course schools i wanted to go to the polish school because there was a Polish school in London, but my mother said, no, you have to learn English now. You could go to an English school. So, so I did. So Alina, before, uh, before we continue, I, there's a couple of comments I want to share with you. One is going to be a real surprise, but before I get to that one, um, a viewer named Douglas asks, um, Helena, uh, well, actually a comment. Helena, thank you so much for sharing what must be terribly difficult memories. Your mother was extraordinarily resilient and inspiring. That's wishing right. you peace from Douglas. Now, here's the other comment. This is from your son, Joe. And oh. Joe is commenting and, and Joe says, can you please ask my mom how she feels that her mom channels herself through my mom even to this day? How does how, how she how, feels? How do you feel about your mom channeling herself through you even to this day? Oh well, I don't know, but I do. I feel that I carry her with me, and I feel that if I'm in trouble, that there's somehow somewhere so she's she's there. I don't know. I, I'm not religious. I am, as my mother used to say, there was some strength over there that 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 is there. And uh, I think if we live a good life, I think we deserve to be um, to be rewarded by that. All I know is that I've had a very nice life, and that uh, any time I'm in trouble, I manage to get out of it. So, and he knows. He knows. <laughs> and, and Helena, there is one more photograph that, um, in the time we have left, I want you to. Tell us about this because it's extraordinary, not just because of the photograph, but what it represents. Yes, that represents a lot. When, uh, you know, there were no social workers to, have to help us like here. There was no help whatsoever. Um, I had to get over the fact about my hand and uh, altogether, you know, not knowing the language, they would, you know, make fun of you if you didn't say the word right in England. They were very fussy. And, um, and I wanted to play tennis, frankly. That was my favorite game. But there were no facilities. But everywhere I got, school, uh, school and, 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 and clubs and everywhere, there was a table. For table tennis it was very early stages in those days but the, the, the people played you know i didn't know very well how to speak english i didn't know the, the english people the english young people and luckily where we bought the house very close by there was a, uh, a club a maccabi club this is there was a for jewish youth and immediately i went and signed up and there was a table and uh, I started playing and the boys started teaching me. I never had a proper teacher, but the boys were pretty good. And they started teaching me and I started getting better. We all organized, we had, uh, you know, uh, teams that we went, we played other clubs. And this was wonderful because it was also social and community, uh, all, in, all in one. And uh, there came 1953, and uh, Israel was, of course, by then created in uh, 1945. So Israel started uh, doing the Maccabea Games, which is the equivalent to Olympic Games. And they are every four years, like the 
Olympic Games, but for Jewish Jews from all over the world. And that was when um, uh, I was, I don't know how, but they chose me to represent England. And the two boys that are behind us somewhere, that, that, that is already in Israel. And uh, so I got to go to Israel for the first time in 1953 to uh, be part of the Maccabea Games. And so here you are taking up a sport, which was, which was a suitable sport given the damage that had been done to your hands. You could do this. Yes. And you became a champion in England and a champion in Israel. Uh, so a remarkable legacy of your mother channeling through you in this as well. Helena, before we get to the closing here soon, um, a couple of more comments. Um, Mr. Trocola's class in Danbury, Connecticut, um, yes. asks, what kept you going insane during this time? How did you feel the day the war ended? What gave you, this, what gave you your strength? Oh, my mother. Your mother. <laughs> my mother, always my mother. Yes, it was always my mother. And uh, well, after all being in such a terrible situation, we were afraid of everything, you know, and suddenly we were free. And it took a while to get used to it. And it wasn't easy. Um, the English are not very uh, acceptable, especially they don't like foreigners at all. You know, they're surrounded by water and they don't, they really were very isolated from from other peoples so we were sort of a new characters there but i must say that uh, they were fair and they as i said they shared what they had which wasn't much they were very bombed out but i found that they were you know they were good people so we managed to get on with our lives as well and uh, as i said you see we could follow various things like you know, table tennis or or schools and and whatever we needed to um, you know to get involved and to try to live a normal life uh, very unfortunately my mother who had been already a record you know um, operated on breast cancer in Poland after my hand was uh, hurt uh, got it again and we lost her and that was 1956 and that was a, a very very hard day for me but uh, that also meant that I decided that next Maccabea Games which I went again I would stay in Israel and I did stay for many years and then <laughs> we came to the United States <laughs> Helena, in, in, we have so little time left, but I do have one more question for you. Yes. In, in the face of rising global anti-Semitism, please tell us why you continue to share your firsthand account of what you experienced during the Holocaust. Well, as you heard a couple of comments already, it is very important to share a first, first witness like that because uh, there is a lot of... Uh, talk about this hadn't happened it was it was you know we made it up uh, i lived through it i'm 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 a witness and i have to honor my mother and the six million that lost their lives in the six million included one and a half million children mm -hmm. and when i think that i just want to cry uh, so it's so important for me to to let you know what happened and so you know, if somebody tells you it didn't happen, you can always send them to me. I will confirm that it has. And I think that there are good people, lots of good people who I think can help me. And once they know the truth, just to spread it and spread it so we can get on with our lives and not try to say that it didn't happen. Just accept it and try to do better. That's what I would like to say. Helena, you say that so eloquently. We are profoundly grateful that you are still are willing to do this, to, to share what you went through, to help educate and inform those who don't have this knowledge that you have. Thank you. And of course, you have made us all deeply, deeply aware of what a wonderful, remarkable woman your mother was uh, and, that, and that you've carried her legacy forward. So thank you for being our first person today, Helena so very much thank you very much for having me and thank you for coming 
and I hope that uh, it, it helps in your futures as well. And then you can carry this message to others, please. It's very, very important for our, for our children's future. Thank you, Helena. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank our donors. First Person is made possible uh, through the generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. And I'd like to also ask you to join us again next month when we have our next First Person program on March 16th, 2022 at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll have a conversation with Holocaust survivor and museum volunteer Susan Warsinger. Susan was nine years old when her neighbors smashed a brick through her bedroom window on the night of November 9th, 1938. This night would become known as Kristallnacht or the night of the broken glass. Join us next month to hear how Susan's parents use their savings to smuggle Susan and her brother Joseph out of Germany to a children's home in a Paris suburb.